So, quiz one. Given the following point configuration, first thing it says is find the electrical force between the two charges. Okay. Electrical force is K Q1 Q2 over R squared. It's going to be 9 times 10 to the 9th. Force, F for force, vector or scalar? Force, vector or scalar? It's a vector. Am I going to put the negative in for this charge or not? No, we decide the direction, although it only asked for the magnitude. I am going to say, oh, and by the way, what would the directions be? Are they repel well, are they repelling or attracting each other? Attracting. Okay, so I'm going to put 5 times 10 to the negative 6. There's my micro coulombs. 3 times 10 to the negative 6. There's my micro, uh, micro coulombs. Divided by, uh, got to be careful. It looks like the radius is 2.35. Is that right? Squared? 1.5 plus 0.85 is 2.35. That's the total distance between them. Nine times ten to the ninth, five times ten to the negative six times three times ten to the negative six divided by two point three five squared. So I type that in right, looks good. Do you get two point four times ten to the negative two? Two point four four. Newtons. In terms of part marks, I'd probably give a half mark for that. Half mark for that, one mark for the answer, something like that. No, you could also have gone 0 0.0244. Yes? But make sure you're two or three sig figs. If you went, oh, uh, wait a minute, Mr. No, yeah, I'm right. I thought for a minute there that four should be a five, but no, that four would be a five and ground it off today. Psst. Pshush. What else can I do with this same diagram? So one thing I can do with two-point charges, and I can say, hey, find the force between them. Another thing that I can do is I can give you a location somewhere, often halfway between them, but in this case, not halfway between them, where I say to you, find the net electric field, or the total electric field. Now, electric field, I'm going to find the electric field from charge 1, which is going to be K q1 over r1 squared. It's going to be 9 times 10 to the 9th, 5 times 10 to the negative 6. I don't put a negative in for fields either. Forces and fields, forget the signs. Divided by uh, the distance to a from charge 1 is 1 1.5 squared. I'm going to be a bit lazy and I'm just going to go like this. Delete, 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 delete. And then what did I say it was? 1.5 squared. 20,000 newtons per coulomb. Direction. Which way would a positive charge want to move if it could? Because of this guy, left or right? Left. Then I'm going to find the electric field from charge 2. And that's going to be 9 times 10 to the 9th, 3 times 10 to the negative 6, all over 0.85 squared. Three times 10 to the negative 6, 0.85 squared. Enter. <coughs> and I get 37,370. Newtons per coulomb. Direction. Which way would a positive charge want to move if it could because of this guy? Also left. So this is left plus left. Am I going to go bigger minus smaller this time? Nope. They're both in the same direction. Final answer is going to be this plus 20,000. Yes, I could have done that in my head, but some of you would be scared if I didn't show you how to do it on your calculator. And I get 57,370 or 5.74. times 10 to the 4th 
newtons per coulomb left. How would I mark this? I would give you a half mark if I saw that. I would give you a half mark if I saw that. I would give you a half mark for the correct magnitude and a half mark for the correct direction. But if you were missing the units, you'd lose a half mark. By the way, what's another way to measure electric field? Not only is it newtons per coulomb, but what else did we learn last day? It's also volts per meter. I'd take either of those units. Okay. What if there was a third charge over here? Oh, you'd find that third electric field and then add or subtract it depending on the direction. What if there was a charge at an angle up here? Now that I will not give you as a written. I have seen it occasionally as a nasty multiple choice. Then you had to draw vectors and add them tip to tail. But almost always they made it a nice 90 degree right angle. So it was nice Sokotoa trick. <coughs> C, find the electric potential at location A. What's another word for electric potential? Voltage. I think they want me to find the voltage at location A. Now the voltage is going to be a combination of the voltage from charge 1 and the voltage from charge 2. Voltage from charge 1, which is KQ over R, is going to be 9 times 10 to the 9th. What was charge 1? Oh, voltage, scalar or vector? Scalar, put the sign in, negative 5 times 10 to the negative 6 all over 1.5. The voltage at location A from charge 1 is... Put a negative right there and delete the squared. Right? Negative 30,000 volts. Direction. Brandon, what? It's a scalar. Okay. Then I'm going to find the voltage from charge 2, which is going to be KQ2 over R2, which is going to be 9 times 10 to the 9th, positive 3 times 10 to the negative 6, all over 0.85. I think all I need to do is delete the squared. I knew I typed in most of that for electric fields somewhere along the way. And I get 31,764.7, which I'll write down. 31,764.7 volts. What's the total voltage? Add them up. The voltage at A is plus negative 30,000. 1,764.7, 1.76 times 10 to the third volts. How would I mark this? Oh, yeah. How would I mark this? I would give you a half mark for that. I would give you a half mark for that. And then I would give you one whole mark for adding them together. Now, if you missed the negative, if you told me the answer was 61,764, I'd probably give you 1.5 but I'd be frowning. Yes? <coughs> Except here's the problem with that. That only works with a constant electric field between parallel plates. The issue here is the voltage and the field are changing every single millimeter that you move. Did you get the same answer? I don't think you did. Say it again. Oh, sorry. Uh, you calculated the electric field in part A. So you went electric field times 1.5 plus electric field times 0.85. Actually, that will work in this case. I would accept that. That's the tricky part. You would have to then say, well, the voltage is negative because the charge is negative, and I guess yeah, you'd have to introduce it into the field somehow. The answer really is 
Which way is the electric field pointing? To the left? If you're traveling this way, which direction are you traveling then? If the field is to the left, you're traveling in a negative direction. Your distance should technically be negative. If I really, really want to get fussy, I'm going to say that that's so tough to keep track of. Between point charges, I fall back on point charges. Good question, though. You caught me off guard for a second. I had to think. You caught me even more off guard than... Right. Number two. Suppose we have a fixed charge of magnitude Q1, which is negative 8 microcoulombs. How much work would it take to move an electron from an extremely large distance away? Now, when they say an extremely large distance away, what do they really mean? Infinity, but we can't quite get to infinity. So extremely large distance away to a final location, 0.15 meters removed. What's this question asking us to find? How much work? Now, in grade 11, work is force times distance, but I can't use that. Why not? Because the force is changing every time I move a millimeter, and this only worked for a constant force. It was also the area under a force versus distance graph. Have they given me a graph here? Say no. It's also change in potential plus change in kinetic. Um, are they talking about speeds anywhere in this question? Then we're going to assume start and end at rest. Work is going to be potential energy final minus potential energy initial. Where am I starting for my initial? Because we defined relative to zero at infinity. You know what? I think for four marks, now I have to make this realization, and I would give marks for seeing that, but for four marks, all I'm going to do is I'm going to find K, Q1, Q2 over R final. It's going to be... 9 times 10 to the 9th. Q1, negative 8 microcoulombs. Q2, electron. What's the charge on electron? Did you say negative? I hope you did. Oh, why am I putting the negative in? Energy, scalar, put the signs in. Negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, all divided by, and I guess my final radius, my final distance, 0.15. Okay, this isn't too bad. 9 times 10 to the 9 times, what's a negative times a negative? I'm not going to bother typing them, then I'll just clue it's positive. You get 7.68 times 10 to the negative 14 joules of work. How would I give out part marks? Well, I'd give out one mark for the answer. I'd probably give you one mark for the equation, one mark if I saw that, and one mark if I saw that, I think. There's four. <coughs> But if you got the right answer, you get full marks. Number three. Troy, what's number three asking me to find? OK, now that they've introduced the notion of speed, I'm not. and uh, have they mentioned work at all? Say no. I'm going to use conservation of energy. I'm going to say kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus Potential energy final. And the nice thing here, Dylan, is because we're on the subatomic level, I'm really not worried about heat. It's not going to make a difference, or not a significant difference. Why can I do that? Initially at rest. So this is going to be K Q1 Q2 over R initial equals 1 half MV final squared plus k, q1, q2, over our final. I think I'm going to minus this to this side 
crunch the numbers, and then I'll get the v squared by itself. So I'm going to write this as k, q1, q2, all over r initial minus k, q1, q2, all over r final. That equals a half m v final squared. 9 times 10 to the 9th. Is that a plus sign on yours? I think it is, yes? Po so positive and positive. Oh, everything's going to be positive, which is kind of nice. 5.5 .5 microcoulombs. Proton is 1.6 times 10 to negative 19, all divided by... My initial distance is not 2.5. What's my initial distance? 3.5 minus... 9 times 10 to the 9th, 5.5 times 10 to the negative 6, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, all divided by our final, oh, hang on, is my initial x, am I moving, sorry, my initial is x, I was looking at this going, wait a minute, I think I'm starting at x and not, I'm moving away, so and my initial is 1, and my final is going to be 3.5, is that right? That equals a half m v final squared. <sighs> Nine times ten to the ninth times five point five times ten to the negative six times one point six times ten to the negative nineteen divided by one. I know I don't need to type divided by one, but I'm gonna go second function enter anyways, so I want that radius there. Seven point nine two times seven point nine two. Minus. Um, on the provincial, I don't think so. So I'm going to say on a test, no. In your homework or in a quiz, probably. But oh, I can't imagine you ever being lazy. Two point two six two nine. This equals a half m v final squared. <coughs> so it's going to be 7.92 times 10 to negative 15 minus that answer. I get 5.657. 5.65. .65. Five. What was it, Mr. Duke? 5.657 times 10 to the negative 15. That equals a half m v final squared. Here we go. V final is going to be, how would I move this one half over? Or times by 2, same as dividing by half. So I'm going to go 2 times 5.657 times 10 to the negative 15. How would I move the mass over? Divide. Hey, what is the mass of a, what are we moving, a proton? What is the mass of a proton? Times 10 to the negative what, Aaron? And then to get rid of a squared, square root. This number, times 2, divided by 1.67, times 10 to the negative 27. Enter. Square root. And do you get 2.6 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? People are nodding. Woohoo! How would I give up part marks there? Holy smokes. What was it worth? Four? I'd probably go something like this. Half mark for that. Half mark for that. One mark for that, that's up to two. One mark for the answer. Oh, heck, you know what? I'd probably give out one mark for each of those. One mark for that and one mark for that. There's your four. So what's this quiz out of that I didn't put a total on? So can you go out of 14 and give yourself a nice clear score there? Please, my children. 
Eight out of fourteen. Let's look at the homework from lesson six. The homework was for those of you who were away. One, two, three, four, five, six. And what we said was we can find the voltage between parallel. Sorry, the electric field between parallel plates. It was the voltage divided by the distance between the plates. Now I should let you know. Let me see if I can find an example here. Uh, desktop, physics 12, electrostatics, ultimate <clears throat> electrostatics review answers. Show me an example, Mr. Duick. So if they ever want you to find the electric field or the voltage between the plates, because the equation is so simple, look up for a second. They'll always give you two distances. They'll tell you how far apart the plates are, which is what you want to use. But they'll almost always in the diagram tell you how long the plates are because it lets them make up more wrong multiple choice answers. And that's really the only good reason for doing it. So just don't fall for that. They will always put two distances on your question. The distance between the plates is what affects the strength of the electric field and the voltage. Having said that, any you want me to go over? Now is your chance to ask. Yep. Number four. Okay, did you get number three? Okay. Then I'm pretty sure that electric field is also the force divided by the charge. That's from you uh, on the equation formula sheet. Yes? That means if I want to find the force that a charge experiences, it's going to be how big that charge is times the electric field that it's in. So if I'm going to do number four, there's how big the charge is, 1.25 times 10 to the negative 3 times that answer. Okay. Oh, and is this charge positive or negative? So it will experience a force east. What if it was negative? West, because electric field is which way would a positive want to move if it could. <coughs> That'll be it. Is that okay? You really, this unit, almost more than any other, you're going to be rearranging the basic formulas quite often and recognizing, look, each one of these is actually two or three equations in one. This one, and then the other one we've done this for is the voltage energy one, last class already. Any others? Then, if you haven't already, you want to hand in lesson five and lesson six, and now we're going to look at lightning. So recall from last lesson, we defined the electric field between parallel plates, and it also apparently does work, Alyssa, between point charges, but I'm not sure I would necessarily go that way. We defined it as the change in voltage divided by how big a distance you were traveling through. And that explains why you had to have the negative distance on the quiz. Okay? Now, an electron or an atom can be ionized, which means it loses an electron, if it's placed in a sufficiently large electric field. Why? Well, the force holding the electron in, so the force holding the electron in is K Q1 Q2 over R squared where Q1 is the positives in the nucleus, and Q2 is this lonely little electron. What was the force from an electric field? What did I answer about 15 seconds ago, Ian? Do you remember? It's on your formula sheet. Find the one that has force and rewrite it to get the force by itself. OK. The force from the field is Q, the electron, times the strength of the electric field. And if my electric field from an external source is big enough, Zach, this force will be bigger than this force, and the electron will ionize. You'll lose an electron, and now it's free. If we're talking about air, because we said, what does it take for a spark to occur? What does it take for electrons to jump a gap, to leave the molecules that they're currently in and jump across to a new substance? 
which is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen plus other trace gases. It takes about 3 million volts per meter. It takes an electric field of about 3 million newtons per coulomb or volts per meter to produce ionization. Now that may seem like a lot, but remember when we were looking at charges of micro coulombs, we were getting electric fields in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. So an electric field of 3 million, not that big. In other words, if you're on a dry, cold winter day, and for example, you're separating laundry and you hear that crackling noise as you pull it apart, that means the electric field right then was more than 3 million. It happens very easily. It's the shock that we get when we walk across a carpet on a cold winter day and then reach for a doorknob. And it's also what's occurring with lightning. If you have an electric field between the cloud and the earth of more than 3 million, and again, roughly 3 million, there's other factors that play a role. On a damp day, you need a bigger electric field because water is a polar molecule. It can absorb an extra electron very, very nicely on its own. On a dry, crisp, cold winter day, well, you guys have noticed that's when things are the most staticky. Any of you ever do a winter out in the prairies? Okay, that's the ultimate. And wow, this is so dry. In fact, most houses have a humidifier, which we don't really care about here in the lower mainland because we're never wanting more water in the atmosphere. We never have a shortage of water in the atmosphere. But out in the prairies, they will. Okay, now chemistry. Evan, each of these effects is accompanied by light. That's what we actually call the spark. We notice it because of the light. The light occurs because the ionized electron doesn't remain free. It will quickly fall into orbit around a neighboring atom, and when it does this, some of its energy, because it's going to lose some energy, some of its energy is released as a photon. You don't need to know that part. That's just telling you, oh, why is there light when there's a spark? That's why. Okay. And you guys in Chemo 12, you guys look at electron orbits and and the fact that it gives up a photon, right? A little bit? Or if you haven't, I think you do. <coughs> so, lightning. You can think of a flat, long cloud like a parallel plate. Roughly. And the bottom of the cloud can get charged. It can get charged to, let's say, 2.5 times 10 to the 8 volts. How? Cosmic rays from space, as they go through, they're hitting particles all the time, and they're moving electrons around, and they can separate electrons, and so you'll have a, a separate voltage. You'll have the top of the cloud be positive, the bottom of the cloud be negative. You've separated the charges. You've generated a voltage. How close does the cloud need to be to the ground for a lightning bolt to occur if the air breaks down, ionizes, at about 3 million volts per meter? Okay. The voltage is equal to, sorry, the voltage divided by the distance is equal to the electric field. And remember I said last day that from now on, because we're going to have equations that have V velocity and V voltage in them, when I'm talking about voltage, I'll almost always put wings on the capital V so you can tell it's a capital V. Let's get the distance by itself. The distance is going to be what? Voltage, I think the D will move up and the E will move down, yes? Voltage divided by electric field. If the clouds are higher than this, it's unlikely that lightning will occur. If the clouds are lower than this, uh, you don't want to be there. Uh, what did we say the voltage was? 2.5 times 10 to the 8th. What did we say the electric field was? Uh, let's see. 3 million volts per meter, so 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. What do you get? Sorry? 83.3 meters. Not that high. Of course, it's very tough for us to tell how high clouds are because we it's it's one of the toughest distances to judge because we don't know how big clouds are right if you haven't clued in by now you figure out how far things are away by measuring with your eyes and your brain believe it or not 
the angle your eyes form from the top to the bottom looking at it and then saying, I know how big it is up close. I can do some trig in my head. It's actually the tangent function. And so I know how far away it is if it's the same size as I'm used to. Problem is we don't have big clouds are. We don't. So it's very tough to look up and say, oh, that's 100 meters away. I'm safe. Or, ooh, that's 75 meters away. I'm not safe. And that's assuming your cloud has that voltage. I just made that number up at random. But this is how lightning occurs. If the clouds were closer than that, now, the real danger is, what if the clouds were at 85 meters? What's going to get them closer to the ground just slightly? Your height. Your height. Right? And that's why people get hit by lightning. We are, unfortunately, when we stand upright, shaped very much like lightning rods. Yes, Miguel, there is an advantage to being short. Kyle would die long before you did. Yes. So, where do you not want to be in the lightning storm? Bad, because you're lowering the distance required for lightning to jump. Bad, because the tree is lowering the distance required, and it will then conduct the electricity through the ground, and you'll pick up some after effects. Now, probably, in all honesty, you would survive underneath a tree in that the lightning would almost certainly hit the tree and not you, but it would be much more likely to hit the tree than anywhere else, and you'd then get the after effects as it then looked to go to the ground, and since you're nearby, you're going to be getting a bunch of current going through you too. Uh, boats are especially bad because sailboats have a lightning rod as their main component. We don't worry about it too much here. Brandon, you going to make it? We don't worry about it too much here. Out east on the Atlantic, especially in Florida, if you ever look at sailing blogs, you'll hear them talking about how they continually are watching the horizon for thunderheads. And if you see thunderclouds, you get out of the ocean as fast as you possibly can. You don't mess around. Like you crank your engine. doesn't matter how much gas you're wasting. You floor it. You drop everything. We had a day planned to just... You don't worry about it. Get out. Because you're in a big lightning rod. There's also all sorts of different, I won't call them urban legends, but not scientifically proven solutions. Some people will say, oh, if you trail jumper cables from your mask into the water, it'll ground it and it'll go through the jumper cables into the water. I've seen some people swear by that. I've seen some people say, no, that's garbage. Or they'll trail a little wire into the water. You know what? You know, the energy involved in lightning is so off the scale, it's ridiculous. Not worth trying. Have any of you been in a prairie lightning storm? Yeah, they're intense. In fact, I've been told during a very, I haven't been in one, I've been told during a nasty prairie lightning storm, the lightning flashes are frequent enough you can almost read a newspaper at night because the image will stay in your eyes long enough for you to read a line and then there's another lightning flash and the image will stay in your eyes long enough for you to read a line and then there's another lightning flash. I, I'm, I love thunderstorms. They don't scare me. I, they do you and they probably should scare me because there's lots of energy, but I like it. Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah. Why, why so much lightning on the prairies? Um, would the prairie ground also be a parallel plate? Mountainous. It means, see, with mountainous areas, and that's where we have our lightning is in the mountainous areas, that's where it's close enough for the voltage to jump the gap to ionize the air. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and ships also, especially the old sailing ships, would have something called St. Elmo's Fire, which was actually a static effect because the masts were wood, lightning, but very, very small amounts would be jumping as well. Yeah. So, a little bit about lightning there. Like being inside of it and actually seeing little sparks didn't seem as big as when I saw it on the news at 12. It was just huge.
It just looked like the fireworks display coming from the van. Michelle says it happened in a split second, but neither she, her husband, nor their three children knew up to a billion volts of electricity had struck their van as they traveled along the four wondering last night's storm. The proof was caught on tape by someone traveling behind them. His reaction was wow, and then he goes, I think we were hit by lightning. Yeah. So I'm sure we were hit by lightning. And I'm like, okay. And I said, well, now I think the car's dead. Like right away, you just, I couldn't hear the engine or anything, but you just kind of found the car was just going a little bit slower than the 40 I was doing. And so and I'm like, I gotta pull over. Despite the fact that one lightning bolt is six times hotter than the sun, the only damage suffered by the Eklund van was to the antenna. Virgin. To the highest part of the car. Not a coincidence melted off. And while it's hard to imagine that no one was actually hurt, Environment Canada officials say to date no one has ever been killed by a lightning bolt while traveling in their car. In fact, Environment Canada officials tell us the safest place you can be during an electrical storm is in your car since it immediately grounds the electricity. Alas, and the Eklund kids say they'll take back to their classmates. Feel like maybe you've got more energy today? Yes. Yeah. A little bit of static for your head? Yeah. You gonna keep the footage and show it to all your friends? Yeah. Yeah. Any lessons that you learned? Any safety tips? Um, it's safe to um, go somewhere rather because yeah. the lightning bounces off. Has nothing to do with the tires. That lightning just jumped several hundred meters. Believe me, it can cover the remaining one foot to the ground despite the tires. It's because your cars are a Faraday cage, and I talked about that earlier, I believe, and if not, I'll talk about it a bit later. Michelle says the only thing that's really changed today is the fact that her husband, Andrew, a Toronto police officer, has now earned himself the nickname Sparky amongst his colleagues. They also say the next time they're caught in an electrical storm on the road, they'll simply pull over. And according to Environment Canada, that's truly the safest thing you can do. In Oshawa with the Eklund, I'm Alex Pearson for City Pulse. I'm pretty sure in Oshawa. <laughs> Figure that's what she said. Slow motion lightning with a high speed camera. So you can see it doesn't follow a straight path, but it's ionizing the air and finding a way to pass electrons through the nitrogen and through the oxygen, and you can see the path that it follows. This is a very, very high speed camera, by the way. I think there's going to be one more here or not. So here it is again in slow motion. There, you saw it suddenly find the grounding. Follow that path. We, we don't get anything out here resembling the lightning that they get out east on, on muggy summer days, like in the Ontario and in the U.S. We don't get anything like that here. All depends. If you're inside a car, if you're in a Faraday cage, you're just fine. Uh, there was one more I wanted to go with. This was an unusual phenomenon. So a photographer snapped this. He managed to catch. I suspect this is several different bolts not one circular bolt but our eyes are treating that as a circle because we don't realize it had several different bolts but interesting picture and i have more but i think later no i have uh airline getting hit by lightning no not the web page i got a different one uh Oh, there it is. Yeah, I couldn't see that. Whoa! Now that happens far more often than you think because what are planes made out of? A lovely conducting material. What are they shaped like? Sideways lightning parallel plates, somewhat. 
and they can roughly half the distance. So the lightning, if it can get to the plane and then charge the plane up and then jump to the ground. So it's a way for it to somehow maybe get there easier. Happens very, very often. But because planes are solid metal, they also act like a Faraday cage. They can handle an awful lot of lightning, no problem. In fact, I'm willing to bet if you've flown more than two or three times, you've been hit by lightning without realizing it. <laughs> and you guys have learned the old counting trick, right? Five seconds to a mile. Yeah. About two and a half miles. Okay. Sorry, what? Oh, most large skyscrapers have lightning rods built in. Oh, yeah, because they get hit all the time. And so they have a nice, very, very conducting path that the lightning will follow down to the ground safely so that it won't hit any of the civilians. Absolutely. So, Ian, recall that if the field is known, we can find the force as follows, F equals QE. Your question was a lovely segue. Okay, Rearranging that little equation there. So what does that mean? Here's another question. I like this question. I like this question. I like this question. I like this question. It says, find the acceleration of an electron placed between metal plates that are separated by 2.5 centimeters and charged to 275 volts. Which way does this electron want to move, up or down? Convince me. Up. Most definitely up. Okay. Let's see. The electron is going to experience a force, and that force is given by the size of the charge, 1.6 times 10 to the end of 19, times the electric field. But what's another equation for force? What was our first equation for force? MA. Really what we're saying is this, MA equals QE. And I'm going to drop the vectors because we already decided up. <coughs> so if I want to get the acceleration, it's going to be the charge times the electric field divided by the mass of the electron. Do I know the charge on an electron? 1.6 times 10 to negative 19. Negative, yeah, we're doing vectors, acceleration, so dips a negative. Do I know the mass of the electron? That's also on your sheet, is it not? It's 9.11, I remember that. 31. Do I know the electric field? <coughs> no. Oh, wait a minute. This is parallel plates. The electric field is the voltage divided by the distance. From yesterday. What's the change in voltage here? 275 divided by What's the separation distance between the plates? And don't say 2.5. It's not 0 0.25. No. 0 0.025. Can someone crunch that? What's the electric field? Sorry? 11,000 even? And I don't worry about sig figs. That's my fi not my final answer. So I'm going to plug this in over here. The acceleration is going to be, what was the charge on an electron? 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. What was the electric field? 11,000 divided by, what was the mass? 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. Find yourself a huge, a huge acceleration. Crunch it.
Vector or scalar? Acceleration. Vectors, forget the signs. I decided the direction up. Right? What do you get? It's it's big. Oh, per second squared, yes. Okay. Very large electron. Well, yeah, because we don't our eyes don't see electrons move. They seem to be instant. They're not. But as far as we're concerned, they are. In a very famous experiment to measure the charge on the electron, how the heck did they get that 1.6 times 10 to negative 19? Well, Millikan, a scientist, he used parallel metal plates to hold in place a charged oil drop. And he knew the mass of that oil drop very, very, very accurately. The oil drop remained in place because gravity pulled it down. The electric field pushed it up. And he was carefully able to tune the electric field and the voltage because we can be very accurate with our voltage. That's very easy to do with electric circuitry, and it even was in the 1900s already. And he was able then to crunch the numbers and figure out what Q had to be. So the charged oil drop is at rest due to balanced gravity and electrical forces. First of all, what's the sign of the charge on the oil drop? Does this have to be negative? Or positive. Why? You're right. If it was positive, which way would it want to move because of the electric field? Down. Which way does it want to move because of gravity? Down. I'd have unbalanced forces. So I know it's negative. A. Negative. B. Write a balanced force equation. Gravity equals electric force. Let's assume they did this experiment on the Earth, which means I don't need to use cosmic gravity. I can use good old mg. Am I going to use for force kq1, q2 over r squared? Are there two charges in this question? Nope. What's my other expression for force then, my friend? Okay, that, that's how you know to fall back to that one, by the way. I don't have two charges. Oh, no problem. You got an electric field, we're fine. Uh, Q. Oh, I don't know the electric field. Wait a minute. What's the electric field? Between parallel plates, it's the change in voltage over how far apart they are. So he carefully measured this distance. He carefully calibrated the voltage until this was hovering. He had measured the mass on a very accurate scale. We knew G is 9.8, and that's how you found the 1.6 times 10 to negative 19. A little more complicated than that, but not much. So a particle of mass that and charge negative 3 electrons is held suspended. What's the voltage required? I think it's the same equation here. Get the V by itself. V equals what? Get the V by itself here. <coughs> Anyone? Get the V by itself here. M times G times D divided by Q. Yep. The voltage is going to be the mass, 2.3 times 10 to the negative 14, times g, 9.8, times the distance, 0 0.015, because it's centimeters, divided by 3 electrons. Now... Technically, my friend, because this is a scalar, I should put a negative here. But if this is zero, I know this is positive. 
what it's really saying is if you're moving in the direction of the electric field, you would have a positive answer. If you're moving in the opposite direction, eh, forget it. I know it's a positive voltage from the diagram. So, how many volts? Don't all rush for your calculators at once. What do you get? Okay. Sorry? 21,000 something? Anybody else? Yes? Yes. Ian, what was it? Give it to me in scientific notation, please. Two point. Is that rounded off properly? I thought you said 21,700. I don't know. Okay, so 2.1 times 10 to the 4th volts. Turn the page. Yo. Oh, is that not the right answer? Okay, when I say is that right and everyone nods, it doesn't help me at all. All right, Mr. Duick. Do it yourself. 2.3. Scientific notation, negative 14, times 9.8, times 0 0.015, divided by, I'm going to have to go brackets here, right? 3 times 1.6. Scientific notation, negative 19. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting 7,043.75, which I agree with. I think you forgot the 3. Brandon, have a seat, my friend. I don't know what you're standing up for, kiddo. Why? No, you want to fall asleep. You're sta getting sleepy. You want to keep it off to stay awake. little advice for you. Ain't going to do you any good. Keep dreaming. What's your homework? One? I'm assuming all of you at least once have got a shock from a doorknob. So, how many volts were you getting? Kind of curious. Um, two is good. Three is good. Six is good. Eight is good. Nine is good. Ignoring you for a second, sorry. By the way, maybe you've noticed in in the old movies when it's time to zap the monster on the table and bring it to life, they always use lightning. I mean, always. And why? Well, because lightning is electrical, it turns things on. Though exactly what lightning does is left to your imagination because. In the end, what makes life, that's still a mystery. But interestingly, and I didn't know this, it turns out that what makes lightning is also still a mystery. In fact, it's kind of a big mystery. Here's correspondent Chad Cohen. It's an elemental force of nature, and still one of the most mysterious. 
Lighting is very difficult to study, and I think we probably understand better how a star explodes halfway across the galaxy than how lightning propagates from six miles out. <coughs> lightning strikes the Earth four million times a day, and after hundreds of years of scientific scrutiny, we still do not understand the essential secret of how it begins inside a storm. It's coming out. That's why Professors Ken Egg and Richard Sonnenfeld and their team from New Mexico <coughs> Tech are on a 10,000-foot mountain waiting for lightning to strike. We're trying to find something new about thunderstorms and lightning. That discovery, I think, is, is worth uh, the risk. Whatever causes lightning to start has always been hidden inside the clouds, so unlocking that process requires waiting for the weather to reach maximum force, then launching sensitive instruments into the heart of the storm. It's hazardous and frustrating. Come on out. So we're trying to figure out what charges the clouds. We think one of the explanations is cosmic rays traveling through the clouds, but not sure yet. Go, go. Get going, get going. Hey, don't drop it. Don't drop it. Okay, let's go, let's go. Go ahead, you get in position. You get in position. Oh. I'm going in, in, in. Hit the ground. A thunderstorm has got the energy of an atomic bomb. <coughs> Dr. Martin Newman is the director of the International Center for Lightning Testing and Research in Camp Landing, Florida. It's the brightest light that we see. It's the loudest noise that we hear. The lightning on Earth would be a nuclear weapon explosion. <laughs> but what triggers the release of all that power? We know that lightning is a huge electric spark. And sparks happen when positive and negative charges build up so much energy they leap through the air to get at each other. It can only happen when the negative charge in that ball on the right and the positive charge in that metal rod on the left get so overwhelmingly strong they cut a path through the air in the middle. It's like a hose full of pressure and it can't hold on anymore. That's what most scientists think is happening. See the bottoms of Thunderhead? Parallel plate. Right? happening inside thunderstorms as ice and water particles collide with each other, moving electric charges to opposite ends of a cloud. When the charge above and the charge below gets strong enough, they leap through the air as a bolt of lightning. Except for one thing. When you actually examine the storm cloud, the strength of the positive and negative charges and the electric field around them isn't nearly enough to create that big spark. Well, the problem is after decades and decades of measurements up in thunderstorms, nobody has ever managed to find an electric field anywhere near that big. Dr. Joe Dwyer is a professor at Florida Tech. Well, maybe we're looking for something that doesn't exist. Maybe there's something wrong with our understanding about how <coughs> electric discharges get started in places like thunderstorms. So if thunderclouds, even great big thunderclouds, don't have electric fields big enough to generate the giant spark that lightning actually is, where's all that energy coming from? Well, here in Florida, they have a pretty dramatic way of trying to figure that out. They launch rockets with really long wires attached to try to create that express lane to ground that lightning likes so much. To get lightning from these clouds to strike where scientists can measure it, requires a simple trigger. First of all, you need to have a propellant that can get this thing up there in a hurry. It has to be able to go 700 yards or so in about two seconds. This is, is it just copper wire? It's Kevlar covered copper wire. Kevlar, okay. So we load it, connect it electrically. When we're about to fire, switches are turned on here manually. After that, everything is done with air pressure from downstairs. Okay, Casey, two, two is on. Three, two, one, fire. From 2,000 feet up, the wire triggers lightning with a path to ground higher than the Empire State Building. And when it strikes, over 100 million volts zap the array of test equipment on the ground. Okay, two, four is good. Go ahead and fire 11 when ready. Two, 11 is armed. Three, two, one. The rockets are, for the first time, allowing physicists to experiment with lightning under repeatable and controllable conditions, so that now Joe Dwyer and other researchers can test an alternate theory of how lightning starts. That theory is called runaway breakdown. Using this model, the energy field inside the storm cloud 
that force between positive and negative, too weak to form a bolt of lightning, is struck by outside particles, bursts of electrons, <coughs> which carry their own energy, very high energy. And with that added energy, you can now get that big spark. You end up with an avalanche of electrons moving near the speed of light. Now this model will work as long as you have one bad electron to start it off. So the first, the finger that pushes the first domino to get the whole thing started. And here's where things get really interesting. Joe Dwyer and many other scientists believe that this outside energy force comes not from the clouds, or anywhere else on Earth for that matter, but from cosmic rays. Tiny subatomic particles ejected from dying stars millions of years ago and billions of miles away. But how do you test this theory? We have 10 of these detectors spread out over the facility right now. Well, it turns out when cosmic particles hit the Earth's atmosphere, they leave a unique signature in the form of gamma and x-rays. If scientists detect these x-rays, they'll have the proof they need. This is what's called sodium iodide detector. There's a piece of crystal in here that will absorb x-rays and gamma rays, and these things are not difficult to measure. They're That's where triggered lightning comes in. <coughs> For the first time, the Florida Research Center's rockets allowed Dwyer to place his x-ray detectors in lightning's path. He made his first series of measurements in 2002. A big negative voltage pulse that means we got a burst of x-rays in the detector. And I actually didn't think we were going to see x-rays. The first plot we brought up, there was a, a nice little pulse that looked just like an x-ray right at the time that the lightning occurred. Like, that's, that's interesting. You know, that's probably a coincidence, you know? What's the chance of that? So we looked at the next lightning stroke, and there was an even bigger pulse in the next one and the next one, and every one had these pulses that looked exactly like x-rays. I think I just about fell out of my chair at that point. Every single lightning strike wire measured showed the presence of x-rays. But ground measurements can't reach high enough to where lightning actually starts. For that, you need to get instruments right up into the heart of the storm. We finally have the technology to build these instruments that are small enough and rugged enough to handle the thunderstorm environment. Light one event won't be enough. I mean, we see an x-ray burst and we call it quits on one event. Well, that's, that's not good enough and it's just going to take a lot of measurements to get in the right spot at the right time. The balloon is sucked into the storm, trailing its cargo of instruments. Launches like these have finally traced x-rays all the way up to where lightning begins, and have given scientists the strongest evidence yet that lightning spark comes from forces outside the Earth itself. These cosmic rays may be the link, which will connect a dying star halfway across the The thing I like about that is the science there, the term physical physics. You heard them talk about electric field and voltage, and they're not getting a big enough electric field, it seems, so far to generate lightning. What's going on? So we're pretty sure it's cosmic rays that are causing lightning. And come on. Got one more if I don't overload my computer. Right click. 